Thank you. So I, I thought I would start with the, um, the, the cases are going to get more difficult as we go, but uh, I think it's always nice to start with something just to get everybody's juices flowing and kind of get you into the mood of an interactive, uh, an interactive uh, afternoon. So this is a 48-year-old uh, man who was referred by his family doctor because of increasing shortness of breath. He had a family history. His father died of an MI, and nobody knows all the details about it, so it was just labeled as an MI at the age of 58, and he had one cousin who had sudden death at the age of 52. We don't have any details uh, on that. We have no autopsy reports or any other information. He has a remote history of smoking, and he quit at the age of 35. There's no history of diabetes or hypertension. The family doc, because of the shortness of breath, did a chest x-ray which showed cardiomegaly, so not an uncommon way for somebody uh, to, to end up being referred to us. He has a three-year history of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, and he has mild sleep apnea, which is not being treated with CPAP, uh, but with a recommendation for exercise and weight loss. His physical examination, uh, blood pressure is 116 on 82, the heart rate is 96, he's regular. The JVP is six centimeters, the chest is clear. He's got a soft holosystolic murmur and there is no S3 and there's no peripheral edema. So this is a gentleman who's come into your clinic. What would you do next? Now I know there's supposed to be an audience response system but I'm not sure if that, if people yes, have. Yes, we, we do. But I think we'll, we'll do the show of hands yeah. then. So um, how many people would do an NT Pro BMP or a BMP? I, I got like, okay, one so. One one Sorry? Yeah. One 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 so well, that's a good, uh, that, is the, uh, that is the question of the day. How many would do an echo? So I kind of want to see every hand up for that. Uh, how many would do a stress test? So uh, an MI in the father and a remote history of smoking, nobody would do a stress test? Okay. How many would do an angiogram? Awad's not here, but I know he would do an angiogram. Oh, there he is. You do the angiogram. <laughs> How many would do an MRI? A biopsy? Okay. So uh, how many would do all of the above? At once. <laughs> all right. So... I think it's probably fair to say that, uh, and I'm going to uh, frame things with a combination of the Canadian Cardiovascular Guidelines and also the American Heart Association Guidelines, uh, just so that you understand my reference point. Uh, but I think most of us would do a BNP at this point. He has cardiomegaly and he's got shortness of breath. And I think uh, from our perspective and looking at, this is uh, just coming out in 2015. These are the latest updated guidelines. And in the guidelines, they actually focused on the role of natriuretic peptides uh, in the management of heart failure. Uh, and the recommendation was that BNP or NT Pro BNP be measured to help confirm or rule out a diagnosis of heart failure in the acute or ambulatory care setting in patients in whom the clinical diagnosis is in doubt. So he's short of breath and he is cardiomegaly, probably not unreasonable to do a BNP in this gentleman. And when it was done, his BNP was elevated. Uh, in terms of other ways to monitor BNP, they also recommend that it be considered in patients with an established diagnosis for prognostic stratification. Uh, in ambulatory patients with heart failure with systolic dysfunction, that the measurement help guide management. This is a, a, a weaker recommendation as opposed to uh, doing it for prognosis, which is a strong recommendation. We use the grade uh, criteria for recommendations on the CCS guidelines. Uh, and, and this, it really is, can only be a weak recommendation. So I have to say, uh, it's not something that I do routinely. Uh, I think the evidence uh, still does remain quite weak for that. Uh, in terms of the echo, I think all of us, and there was uniformly raised hands for echo, so this is uh, looking at the uh, heart failure guidelines published in 2013, that uh, it's a class one recommendation for a two-dimensional echo with Doppler be performed during the initial evaluation of patients presenting with heart failure, which at this stage we now think he has, to assess his left ventricular ejection fraction, LV size, wall thickness, and valve function. So uh, I think that's reasonable. And if we actually then go to the appropriate use criteria, remember that uh, what we're trying to do in terms of thinking about sustainability of healthcare, of course, is to do appropriate testing and to avoid inappropriate testing because inappropriate testing can be associated with overuse, waste, and harm. Uh, some of the tests that we do do carry uh, radiation exposure and or risk of 
uh, significant uh, events. And moreover, they're actually quite expensive. So I think it's always nice to frame things in terms of the appropriate use criteria. So for this gentleman with newly suspected or potential heart failure, he actually has an appropriate score for echo. And interestingly enough, and maybe because it's an American uh, document, an MRI would also be considered to be appropriate uh, in this gentleman. And then uh, I was trying to push you, but you can see that uh, in this setting, with this uh, picture, that it would be rarely appropriate for us to consider cath. Okay? So um, that's one thing. Now, the only thing I would say about the issue of considering some form of imaging for his coronaries is that he has this positive family history and he has a positive smoking history, and he has new onset heart failure, and he's a male, and he's of the right age. So in that context, where you're worried about maybe ischemia is the etiology of his heart failure, since it is still the commonest cause of heart failure in the Western world, uh, even though he doesn't have angina, with those types of risk factors, uh, they actually would recommend consideration of some form of imaging uh, to assess his coronary vasculature. So uh, we did an echo, and uh, I'm not an echographer, but even I know that this doesn't look very good. Uh, I don't know if you want to make any specific comments on the echo. Yeah, no, it, you know, the two-chamber view looks like uh, severe depressed EF. The inferior wall looks like it's infarcted, so it looks worse than the other wall. So it raises your point, Heather, extremely appropriately that you should invest for coronary, investigate for coronary disease. Everybody comfortable with that? Yeah. Nice to have. His RV is also down. Yeah. Nice to have the expert in the room. Uh, thank you. So we actually did do an angiogram, um, and the angiogram, as you can see, uh, is normal. So he had normal angiogram. We do. Uh, we're pretty uh, aggressive with hemodynamic evaluation of our patients, and he had uh, the following hemodynamics: so an elevated wedge pressure and a mixed venous of 54. So, happy, unhappy, worried, not worried. So I think the, the issue is you're worried, right? Yeah. So right now we're at the diagnosis and treatment uh, stage for this gentleman. Uh, we have diagnosed him with a, a dilated cardiomyopathy. Would, everyone would accept that diagnosis. Yep. So in that context, uh, in new onset heart failure, we come back to the issue of what do you think the role of a heart biopsy is here? So who in the audience would do a biopsy? <laughs> is this condition getting worse and worsening and we have any things like this myocarditis or anything bad? So that is a great point, right? And really when you actually come to the actual guidelines, what they tell you, they do give it a 2A, okay? So, but importantly, this is, the, this is the information that you have to remember when you're considering a biopsy, when there's a specific diagnosis that is suspected. So if I told you this patient had ongoing uh, elevated troponin, if the patient was presenting with dominant ventricular arrhythmias and I was concerned about giant cell or lymphocytic myocarditis, uh, if there were features that were going to lean me that way, if the patient had a history of mixed connective tissue disease, uh, for example, some of these things that may make me wonder about the possibility of myocarditis, not only would I do a biopsy to actually make that diagnosis, but it might actually inform my ability to treat. Remembering that there are good case series on immunosuppression for giant cell. There's good case series for immunosuppression in lymphocytic, and in the collagen vascular diseases, most all of us would actually treat uh, with uh, immunotherapy. If this patient had had a history of anthracyclines, the other thing that we can find that's pathognomonic on a biopsy is anthracycline toxicity, which has very specific uh, histologic features. But in this gentleman, it didn't feel that way, and so we did actually not do a biopsy. So, Hopefully, this is going to be old hat. What are we going to do to treat him? This should be slam dunk for everybody. What are we going to do to treat him? One question regarding this issue, regarding the biopsy. As you know, not all centers have ability to do the biopsy, yep. and good pathologists look at it. Would, yep. you, would you go up, like, instead of using an MRI? Yeah, so that's another. Empirical treatment. So it's an. Excellent point, and we have done that as well. So, one of, so what Awad is suggesting is 
that an MRI might be very helpful to actually see whether or not you had gadolinium that might indicate inflammation and might make the biopsy a more reasonable thing to consider doing. And if you did the MRI and it was entirely bland, that the likelihood on a biopsy that you're going to find something is lower. So I think that that is also a very, very reasonable point. And if you have the capacity to do MRI, I think that'd be a very reasonable thing to do to inform the decision to biopsy. It's an excellent point. Okay. Excuse me. Before just we go to treatment, I, I want to ask about the pro -PMP because yesterday I tried to make a point regarding pro -PMP not it's not diagnosis for heart failure. So please can you clarify this because I said this is clinical, heart failure is a clinical... Heart failure is a clinical diagnosis. There is no doubt about that. So what I gave you in terms of the physical findings uh, and uh, the, the picture was that he is short of breath, yes. he is cardiomegaly, his JVP was elevated, he was tachycardic, uh, and he has an ejection fraction. Yeah. He, he, he's got heart failure. Uh, I think that the CCS, in light of the vast amount of data coming out on BNP, if that patient presented to emergency room and you were following, for example, the BNP trial or breathing not properly trial or the red hot trial, where the patient also had a history of asthma or something else and they're short of breath and you're there and you just don't know if that shortness of breath is a heart failure related shortness of breath or maybe an asthma or COPD exacerbation, it's not unreasonable to do a BNP because if they BMP is above 500, they have heart failure, right? So I don't use BMP to make, I personally don't use BMP to make a diagnosis. It is a clinical diagnosis, but it can aid in the diagnosis. Yes. So uh, I just on that note, Heather, uh, and, um, we don't, we don't, our lab, we have funding issues with BMP in our hospital, so we don't use it. I worked seven years at Baylor when we had it, and in my opinion, I can't see a great deal of difference in how patients are appropriately treated and their outcomes between the two centers. Yeah. So that's coming back to does BMP guided therapy make a difference? And again, remembering the evidence for that is weak, and so the recommendation is weak. Uh, where I think BNP, so from per, so we have BNP, uh, we don't do anti-pro BNP, we do BNP, but effectively it doesn't matter. Where we use BNP is very much in our chronic heart failure patients as a prognostic, and, and I think the data for that is actually extremely strong. And we also use the BNP pre-discharge, yeah. and there's very strong evidence that the BNP pre-discharge, if it is very high, indicates a, a very high risk of death and rehospitalization within six months. So the, it, 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 you do it, and then you, you know, the real question isn't measuring the BNP, the real question is, then what do you do? Right. Uh, and so what we do is we have a, a sort of a triaging stratification at discharge. And a patient with a high BNP who's discharged from hospital will be seen within two days in the clinic. And that's the difference. But, and that's why we do it, because then I know that I need to get that patient in to the multidisciplinary clinic within two days of discharge. Uh, we have a rapid clinic. We call it the Rapid Heart Failure Clinic. And we run it five days a week. Uh, it is run by our nurse practitioner, and we have the capacity to slot patients in as required, and that's why we use it. If somebody is discharged and their BNP is not significantly elevated, they will be seen within two weeks of discharge, uh, and that's actually how we use it to help triage and to help try to prevent readmission. So treatment, I'm, I'm really hoping, guys, that this is pretty straightforward. Uh, I don't think any of us are going to argue with this. The guy's wedge was elevated. You're going to die recent to euvolemia. You're going to initiate an ACE inhibitor uh, followed by beta blocker. We can argue about which first. I personally still do the vasodilators first. Uh, and then you're going to reassess his clinical status and make a decision about whether or not to add an MRA. And this will be in your handout, so I'm not going to go over it in detail, but I think it's a really nice flow diagram uh, from the latest guidelines that actually out outlines really how you want to approach uh, the medical management of these patients. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave that for you because I know that you're going to have copies of all of these slides. So this is where we got to with him. He got on to two and a half twice a day of Oltase, uh, Core 25 twice a day, Lipitor 10, Aldactone 12.5, Coumadin because of his paroxysmal atrial fib. Uh, he very adherent with a salt and uh, fluid restriction and he got into cardiac rehab. So uh, are these medications at target? How do we define target? 
maximum, maximum tolerated medical service. Or what was proven in a clinical trial, whichever comes first, right? So target is determined by the maximum tolerated dose or what was proven in a clinical trial, whichever comes first. And in his case, we were unable to optimize because he started to develop issues of presyncope uh, and, and renal dysfunction. So if you see somebody and you're managing them and they start to develop uh, issues with the elevated creatinine, what's the first thing that you're gonna look for? Overdiabetes. Overdiuresis is the very first thing that you look for, right? Uh, so that's one of the most important things in terms of trying to deal with the hypotension, we stagger the medications. Now, it's all very well and good to talk about staggering medications, but you need to have an incredibly adherent patient to do it. Uh, but we do a lot of staggering doses of medication. So we might end up with a BID ACE inhibitor at breakfast and dinner and the BID beta blocker at lunch and bedtime as a way to actually try to minimize or mitigate uh, some of the problems with hypotension. Uh, so, and, and, and we actually will slow down and do incredibly gentle titrations, and I've been known to do my titrations of carvedilol at 1.56 increments, uh, and I've had patients with blood pressures in the high 70s, low 80s, that I've been able to actually get up to 25 twice a day by taking it very, very slowly. We ended up discontinuing the aldactone because of renal function and hyperkalemia, so that was a problem. Even after having him address his diet and think about all the things that he shouldn't be eating, like licorice and uh, potatoes and tomatoes and yes. Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. Can you help me understand? Help us understand uh, why or if one would introduce aldosterone inhibitor before maximizing as much as tolerated the ACE inhibitor? So it's a great question. So the question is, why would I add an MRA if I don't have my ACE inhibitor at max dose? And the answer is that the actual millimeter drop in mercury with 12 and a half or 25 aspironolactone is effectively nothing, uh, as opposed to Ramipril where uh, you may see a two to five millimeter drop in blood pressure. So if I have somebody whose blood pressure is extremely borderline, uh, and they're starting to run into some symptoms related to that, I will try to get an MRA on board because it really doesn't do anything, in my experience, it doesn't do anything to the blood pressure. doesn't mean it'll work, but I will try because uh, I think it's still better to have them on a little bit of it if I can, even if they're not yet at maximum ACE inhibitor due to blood pressure issues. So I, I want to just sort of uh, um, do a little bit of uh, commentating on what we do, right? I mean, guideline-directed therapy is, is obviously good, but it's not perfect. So if we think about the decrease in mortality, there's your ACE inhibitors, your ARBs, your beta blockers, and your MRAs. But the reality is that we know that the heart failure mortality remains very, very high despite that. And I know that... Um, uh, that Amar talked a little bit about the ARNI yesterday, which is the angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor, or uh, LCZ696. So it's important to understand this drug a little bit better. It actually has a neprilysin inhibitor, and it also has valsartan, or an ARB, and it's the actual combination of these two active moieties that create the drug LCZ696. Now, we have done uh, uh, ARNIs before, and does anybody remember the drug that we tried before? Omipatrolat? Oh, yeah. So people may remember Omipatrolat. So Omipatrolat actually did show some benefit. The problem with Omipatrolat was a much increased risk of angioedema, which was life-threatening. And as a result, the drug was, uh, was pulled from the market. So uh, we know that these drugs can be effective, but that was certainly one of the concerns. And, and really, if you come back to the pathogenesis of heart failure and what we're actually trying to do, we know where ARBs work and ACE works and MRAs work. And when we talk about a drug like LCZ, we're not only uh, inhibiting neprilysin, which as a result prevents breakdown of natriuretic peptides, remembering the natriuretic peptides cause naturesis and vasodilation. Uh, we're also, because of the valsartan, we're also getting ARB benefit as well. 
So the way the paradigm study was done was actually quite brilliant. They had um, a, a single blind uh, run-in period, which allowed us to prove that the patient could tolerate the doses of the medications. So they were on an allopril, and then they switched out to the LCZ, targeting 200 milligrams twice a day. And at the end of the single blind run-in, if they tolerated the medications, they went into the double blind period. As a result, there weren't very many withdrawals from the study because they'd already proven that the patients could tolerate it. And just to land on, I mean, I think uh, most people aren't used to seeing that many zeros. Uh, the primary endpoint dramatically uh, improved for LCZ, cardiovascular death improved, and hospitalization for heart failure improved. Now, just to, to frame it, this was a contemporary group of patients, and the use of beta blockade was 93%. So this is a really pretty dramatic benefit over and above uh, standard medical therapy. And if I put it into a little bit of context for you, uh, uh, compared to some of the other studies that have been done, you can see the uh, number needed to treat. Uh, really, for paradigm, it's actually pretty impressive at 35 in order to save a life. Now, it's going to be a little bit of time yet before the drug uh, is released. There's been a lot of discussion about whether or not one trial is enough to change management. The statisticians have had their way with it, and because of the numbers of patients enrolled in the study, and the dramatic benefit, the answer to that has been, yes, one trial should be enough to change management. So unfortunately, I didn't have that drug for this patient, but we did see an improvement. The ejection fraction went up to 32%. It was less MR and TR and less pulmonary hypertension. And the improvement was largely, I think, attributed to the medications. And now he's sitting with an EF of 32%. I'm sorry? Regarding the paradigm trial, yes. I read the protocol and I read similar letter from non There are a little bit gaps in this trial. Yes. What do you think the gaps are? There are almost around six gaps. I wrote the letter. Number one, the dose of uh, the compare Valdartan, patient receives 320 milligrams of Valdartan plus the Nabrisilin, comparing Nabrisilin to 80 milligrams. And we know that is S inhibitor is just dependent on decreasing the amount of time. Number two, the group of inalabrin um, were more sicker. That was in higher deduction, higher in mineral for the most significant. The physical movement, higher in deduction, higher in understudy, and that was so also say this. So let me take them one at a time. The salt trial looked at analytical 10 twice a day, that was the target dose for analytical. Yes, but, the, but the still, the guidelines are to 40 milligram, and yeah. also in the atostride, that is a little bit more. So that's lysinopril, 40 yeah. milligrams. But the salt trial was with an allopril, 10 milligrams twice a day. But in process of trial, they increase the dose. In process of trial, you are more sick patients, they also increase the dose up to 30 and 40, and some people receive the dose 40. I understand, milligrams. but if you look at the evidence-based trials for mm -hmm. an allopril, in the salt trial, it was 10 milligrams twice a day. That was the target. The second point, which is more digoxin and MRA, we can have a good long debate about whether digoxin actually does anything. So I wouldn't use that as an argument to say that the group was treated better because there is no mortality benefit for digoxin. Just, just right? What's your third gap? Also, the now about the Alzheimer's second and you because the longer term safety is very important this time. About the Alzheimer's, never seen a diagnosis. That is that is Alzheimer now more common and now in uh, this month the newer in one day the publishing in the gap about the Alzheimer and never seen antagonist and so that the four hours is enough to see it is that the Alzheimer we have or not. Yeah, I don't think I actually followed the question, I'm sorry. About the Alzheimer, the incident about the Alzheimer. So what, what would we do next with this patient? Ejection fraction 32%? Sorry? This is his ECG. So we target doses? He's on target doses as much as he can tolerate. What is his functional status now? So he's functional class 2. CRPD. Yeah, so I think most of us at this stage, he's functional class two, he's in sinus, he's got a prolonged QRS, and he's still got MR. And I think the reality is in this patient, we would implant uh, CRTD. Uh, just to run over uh, the uh, sort of two CRT trials that looked at milder degrees of heart failure, we have the MAT at CRT, which clearly showed a benefit for CRTD. Uh, and we have the RAF trial as well, which also clearly showed a benefit in terms of death or rehospitalization 
uh, death from any cause or hospitalization. So as a result, when you actually put them all together, we can see very clearly that there is a mortality reduction, and there is no doubt that we would actually put a CRTD in this patient. Here's the heart failure hospital reduction. We know there's a clear improvement in quality of life, a clear improvement in ejection fraction in those patients who respond, and he fits the actual absolute criteria for somebody who would uh, respond. So that was uh, just to give it easy starting case. Yeah, okay. Still creates controversy. Just yes. We leave them on target card dose for three to six months before we consider the ICD CRT. So in a non-ischemic uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, now most people would actually wait six to nine months. Six to nine months. Yeah. For the CRTD, will the decision be different if the patient remained in AFib? So, yeah, the, the data for AFib in a left bundle branch block is still, uh, so obviously the class one criteria is sinus rhythm in a left bundle branch block. But even in atrial fibrillation with a left bundle branch block, uh, if you look at meta-analysis data, you may still get benefits. So then you're going to get down to this issue of, of talking to the patient and, and sorting it out. But if you're already going in there to implant an ICD, I have to tell you in our program, in atrial fib with the left bundle, we would implant a CRTD because if you put the ICD in and then the patient starts to deteriorate and you have to go back in and actually change the, uh, the pacemaker, your pocket, and add the lead at that time, you're going to increase the risk of infection and other complications. And is there any second uh, Just to add here, uh, it is a class 2A uh, in the guidelines. Uh, you uh, provided that the, the, the second case. If the pacing is, is above 90%, if there's a steady problem with that, then either to optimize your medication or if not feasible, then you go for AD modulation. Uh, yeah. So we, we would, at our center, put a CRTD in that patient. Yes. As regards to myocarditis, would you consider uh, the cushion content heart failure, troponin elevated, etc. Uh, would you consider biopsy in all cases of myocarditis, or specifically when yeah. you're suspecting the giant cell? Yeah. And if so, what are the uh, things pointing out? So, so it's a great question, and the 2A, and the 2A, class 2A, which is a you may consider, that's what a 2A language lands on, uh, is if you suspect. So uh, you can drive a truck through that indication, right, uh, because it doesn't give you any other information around that indication. So uh, there are, uh, we have gained, and we talked a little bit about it yesterday uh, with Dr. McKenna's talk. Uh, what we found at the time of transplant is one of the, so the commonest diagnosis that we missed, even though we're pretty aware going in, was ARBC. The second commonest diagnosis that we missed in our program was sarcoid. And sarcoid is a treatable cause of cardiomyopathy. So the reality is that uh, knowing that it is a 2A indication, we have become a, more aggressive with biopsying. But we do do the MRI, as Awad said. I mean, we're very fortunate that we have a lot of this uh, available to us. So in, in somebody from a giant cell myocarditis perspective, they usually present as a rhythm dominant presentation. So it's somebody with electrical storm and biventricular dysfunction, usually acute onset in the absence of a family history of sudden cardiac death. Uh, I can tell you that we've had challenges with those patients because their ventricles are so irritable. Um, and I have had one patient arrest at the time of biopsy, successfully resuscitated, but it can be, you know, it's the sort of thing that can make you perspire in your, <clears throat> in your cath lab with the bioptome in your hand. Uh, but we also, uh, you know, we have a very, very heterogeneous population in Toronto, and sarcoid is much more common in blacks. And so if I have a, a, a black patient present with no history of hypertension and dilated cardiomyopathy, I will always look for sarcoid. Now, usually what we do is a PET scan, which is considered the uh, imaging procedure of choice for sarcoid, and if the PET scan is at all suggestive, then we get tissue. Uh, and the reason is because I can treat it. I can use steroids and disease-modifying drugs, and I can change the actual course and maybe prevent the need for transplant. So we've become more aggressive with biopsy, but I don't just biopsy because the trope is elevated. I biopsy because I usually have a question in my mind. Uh, and in that way, I'm, I'm trying to manage the risk uh, of biopsy uh, 
and the information that I'm going to get from it. We don't have checked this here, so what, what is the role of a empiric um, steroid and or immune suppressor without getting biopsy? So, so the reality is that the evidence, such as it is, suggests that there's no role at all. Uh, there are a lot of challenges and problems with the studies that were actually done. Uh, IVIG has been looked at and steroids have been looked at. The trials, and this is one of the challenges with, with new onset heart failure, which is what happened in the clinical trials, is that it's, a, again, a very heterogeneous group of patients. So some will have presented with a fulminant course. Some might have had heart failure uh, symptoms for six to eight weeks, and they still get included in the trial, and they may actually not be the same uh, actual category or type of patient, but the reality is, with the evidence such as it is, uh, there is no evidence for routine treatment. Now, uh, having said that, again, there is evidence on case series, and if you read Leslie Cooper's data, uh, certainly on giant cell, he's a strong advocate for treatment, and we do treat giant cell usually with steroids and a disease modifier such as tacrolimus. So if I have a patient who is too unstable to be biopsied and the clinical picture is highly suggestive of giant cell, uh, then I treat because I, I sort of feel that I don't have much to lose. So there's, there's always going to be that gray area in there, but routine treatment of every case of myocarditis with immunosuppression is not recommended. Um, and in general, some of the concern is that if you still have active viral replicating and you treat with steroids, in fact, you may worsen the myocarditis. So that's the downside of doing it. Um, and that's why I think there has to be some caution around it. Uh, so, well, not in that patient because uh, that patient did did well. Um, if I have a patient who presents in in obviously in, in fulminant myocarditis, then yes, we do use mechanical circulatory support to uh, support that patient. And in general, the more fulminant the presentation, the greater the chance of recovery. So in somebody who actually presents with an eight-hour history or a 10-hour history, uh, which are patients that we do see, uh, if you can actually support them, they, they almost, in, in our hands, about 70% will recover completely. Uh, we usually use ECMO, VA ECMO in that context, uh, because it's a yeah, percutaneously approach uh, and you're not actually dealing with sternotomy in a patient who's absolutely critically ill. Okay, we'll move on. Yes. Um, so this is a 58-year-old man who was well until May 2011, and he has no prior cardiac history. He'd had an embolic stroke in 2005 and has minimal residual uh, right-sided weakness. He had a recurrent stroke in 2006 with no residual de uh, deficits at all. Uh, hypertension, uh, elevated cholesterol, and a 15-pack year smoker who quit in 2009. He's had a 20-year history of diabetes and does have some CKD with a creatinine of 129. He's on a Lipitor 40. He's on aspirin and Plavix, which is an interesting combination considering that he was thought to have an embolic stroke, but that's what he was on when he came to us. Uh, he's on gliburide, metformin, some amitriptyline, and ramipril 5. Uh, he presents with a long-standing history of indigestion, uh, which was atypical in its nature. It had been going on for about 10 years. Uh, and the symptoms really sounded like indigestion. They occurred both with rest and activity. And then in 2011, he presented to the emergency department with shortness of breath on exertion, uh, relief with, uh, with rest. He had no other complaints. He still had this history of the indigestion symptom, but he didn't give a, a history of traditional uh, angina. Uh, when we saw him, he had a mild troponin elevation in the emergency room. Uh, I'll show the ECG. The chest x-ray showed vascular congestion, and the echo showed uh, an EF of 30% with some segmental wall motion abnormality. So this is his ECG. I think probably from an exciting perspective, from my point, he's actually got R waves, which always make me a little happier when the left ventricular is down. Makes me think that maybe the anterior wall might exist. A possible inferior infarct here and uh, STT change consistent with lateral ischemia. So, what do you do now? You go to the Pearl, uh, get tickets for Argentina's World Cup game, Viva Messi, uh, right? Best player in the world. Arrange a rapid clinic consultation, admit to hospital, uh, call a WAD uh, for a code STEMI for urgent primary PCI.
Um, hope, hopefully, we're going to the pearl. But I think uh, I think uh, most of you would do what? Admit them, right? You're going to admit them. So we, we did a, a nice study. Uh, we looked at over 13,000 patients with acutely compensated heart failure who presented to the emergency department, and we stratified them by troponin. Uh, and we looked at the hazard ratio for mortality and days after the ED presentation. And you can see that a positive troponin is associated with an incredible hazard ratio of death. So when a patient with heart failure presents to the emergency room, with a troponin elevation, uh, we would recommend that you admit that patient because they are high risk of dying. So the patient was admitted. Uh, they were uh, optimized in hospital and did all the usual things. We In hospital, we got them up to 10 a day of Altase and uh, 40 of Lasix. They got touched with a little bit of Carvedilol with a planned up titration in the outpatient setting. And the question now for you is, why does he have heart failure? Oh, he's got a diabetic cardiomyopathy. He's been following Messi around, spent too much time in Argentina, and he's actually got Chagas. Um, he's got coronary artery disease, and he, he's got a dilated cardiomyopathy. What is the most likely diagnosis? Yeah. So, when we think that we've got coronary disease, obviously what we're trying to sort out is, is there myocardial ischemia? And if there is, then is the anatomy suitable for bypass surgery? And I guess one of the biggest controversies right now currently is this issue of viability. Uh, and the question is, is there a viability such that revascularization will help? And I guess the question really that we have to ask ourselves is in light of the STITCH trial, does this question actually matter at all? So our, our current guidelines recommend non-invasive imaging for patients with heart failure be considered in order to determine the presence or absence of coronary artery disease. And that's a strong recommendation with moderate quality evidence. So what would you do to image the patient? A DSC, a PMIBI, a perfusion MRI, a PET scan, none of the above, all of the above. Because of stitch, there's no point, so don't bother. What would be the routine test that would be done here? What was this? Yeah. Yeah. So coronary angiogram is not an option? Uh, I'm imaging the patient for ischemia and viability. I'll get to the angiogram in a bit. So Heather, I'll tell you what I do, and tell me if it's completely crazy. My experience with nuclear imaging, and I'm not talking about PET scanning, I'm talking about SPECT maybe, is if the EF is very low, and if there's a bundle branch block, the results have not been great when we ultimately cath the person, which we often do anyway. Mm -hmm. So what is your feeling about, and I, just to echo the audience, I mean, viability and functional ischemia is one thing, but personally, I just cath these guys, first off. Yeah, so, so I think that, you know, if you actually ask uh, a bunch of heart failure people, you will uh, divide the room uh, almost half and half. Uh, half will go straight to cath, and the truth is I would go straight to cath. That is my usual because uh, the patient has shortness of breath. The EF is 30%, and if it's revascularizable, I would revascularize him. But I can tell you that the other half will say uh, contrast exposure with potential for contrast-induced nephropathy, one in a thousand risk of heart attack, stroke, or dying. Uh, if there's nothing to bypass because there's no ischemia anyway and the shortness of breath is just heart failure, then, then why bother because I'm going to do an angiogram and not going to act on the information. So I'm providing both halves of that equation uh, for the sake of argument in our program, we would cath the patient. Uh, I do have to say though that we do do a fair amount of uh, ischemia and viability imaging and I, I'm going to comment at the end on my editorial thoughts on, on STITCH. but. Uh, um, or why don't I just do that now? So the problem with the stitch viability uh, study is that the viability test was not mandated. So it is a hodgepodge of different viability assessments and MRI and PET, which most people think are the best studies, were actually not part of the stitch viability. So in my opinion, I don't think the paper would have ever gotten into the New England if it hadn't been accompanying the original stitch paper. I think there are enough holes to, to, to really say we haven't actually answered that question. 
I just want to add two comments here. One is, uh, in my opinion, the coronary angiogram and these functional studies give you two necessary and complementary information. I agree. One is anatomical and one is functional. Yeah. And you need the combination to be able to make rational decisions. I agree. And number two is that you know often we see hypokinesia here and there scattered, and some akinesia. Uh, clearly, by definition, the hypokinesia is equal to viability, similarly as all wave on the ECG. So if I've got all wave on the ECG, I mean personally, I don't even bother to viability. I know this is bad, and the patient goes for a program, and then decision is taken accordingly. What are your views? So, so I agree that the tests are complementary. Uh, I agree completely. Uh, do I think that in a guy who has no angina that you can just operate on him uh, with an EF of 30% based on R waves on the ECG? Probably, but we would still do some form of functional imaging, I have to be honest, right? Um, so in our center, we, we do do a number of these different ones, and I think you know the point on this is that uh, all four are, are excellent uh, at ischemia and viability, and it depends on your center and your center's expertise. So if we, again, come back to our heart failure guidelines, there are several methods, all of the ones that I've shown you, and you really need to look at local factors to make your decision to, in terms of what you're going to do. We have an aggressive nuclear imaging center, and they have done some very innovative things with thallium, including thallium infusions, respiratory distribution, and 24-hour reinjection late studies, and have published on that uh, as a way to try to improve uh, the images. And I'm just going to show you an example here. So here is the stress uh, test, which is, looks pretty nasty. And the rest really doesn't show an awful lot. Uh, but remember, as we've talked about, no reversibility doesn't necessarily equal no viability. And when we did a rest redistribution study and then a reinfusion study, you can see that there is a lot more uptake of tracer uh, suggesting viability. We also have an aggressive uh, PET center. We were involved in the PAR study, which I'll share the results with you, which was a large Canadian center of PET-guided therapy uh, for ischemic cardiomyopathy. And this just gives you an example of what you can see with PET uh, with the FDG uptake of glucose, which tells you that the cells are actually alive uh, compared to the perfusion images. So again, a fair amount of viability there. And we can map that in such a way that we can uh, give a quantitative percentage of how much is viable. So in this setting, this shows us a great deal of viability uh, and would support the idea of revascularization, whereas this would support uh, no revascularization. Yes? Can I ask the question, so you do nuclear stress tests, you do viability study or stress stress images? So, so I like... Are you looking for ischemia or are you looking for viability? Yeah. I like to do one test, and so I do a stress test viability, okay, so right? I get it all done in one test. So, so for me, because of our nuclear lab, I mean, we do the vitamin stress echo as well. So if I have really good uh, acoustic windows in the patient, I'm happy to do a DSC, which is going to give me both. Uh, I'm happy to do a percentine thallium reinjection, which gives me both. And I'm actually really happy if I, could, if I do a perfusion MRI. Um, and so we do a fair bit of those as well. So a little bit is dependent uh, on the patient. The idea behind the perfusion MRI, of course, is that there's no radiation. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a, a much favored test for us in patients who aren't claustrophobic. I think the question is not when you get ejection fraction of 30% and you get viability. The question is when you get ejection fraction of 30% and no viability. You do not send this patient for angiogram. This is the... Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually gonna, gonna talk about that as well in just a minute. So this, this actually is the, is the PAR study. So if I use PET as the example, uh, what we showed was that if the PET said do not revascularize, so I'll come back to this picture. So if this was the PET, the recommendation would be not to revascularize. And if this was the PET, the recommendation would be to revascularize. So when you actually adhere to the recommendation, we saw a significant improvement uh, in survival. Now, can I tell you that my surgeons will not operate on an EF of 30% with no viability? No, they will still operate on some of those patients. 
I don't know that that's the question. The question is whether or not those patients still benefit. So, uh, and, and we're going to talk about the stitch outcomes. So just, just bear with me. So I, I think we we actually do try in patients without angina. We do try to to we still, rightly or wrongly, do pay attention to what the imaging tells us. So I do think you need ischemia testing, and if you've got lots of ischemia, you don't need a viability test. You've answered your question. If you have no ischemia, we will still do a viability test. And if there's no viability, then we get really, really anxious, but we generally don't operate. Uh, so in terms of uh, the CCS recommendations, they land on uh, those patients who have heart failure and reduced EF if they have reversible ischemia, which is what we talked about, or 7% hibernating myocardium or viable myocardium on PET, or 20% of the left ventricle is shown as viable by DSE, uh, then the recommendation is to consider revascularization. So these guidelines came out after STITCH and out after the STITCH viability study, and, and, and really the reason that, that the practical tip landed on this is because there's so much other evidence about the role of viability, and many people do not believe the STITCH portion, the viability portion of the STITCH study was adequately done. So we have still landed on this as a, as a recommendation. Uh, so um, I, I think I know the answer to this, so, but uh, I guess the next uh, question is what would you do next? And I think the answer uniformly from the crowd was angiography, because you're all mad that I didn't do it first. Uh, so this is his, uh, his angiogram, and sorry that it's uh, still pictures, but I think you can see uh, that he does have targets, uh, although he has fairly nasty coronary artery disease. Uh, and so just to move along so that I don't take up all the time, uh, we do recommend angiography in patients with heart failure and ischemic symptoms, which is not this gentleman because he was just short of breath. Uh, so consider it in patients with systolic heart failure, EF less than 35%, which is this gentleman, at risk for coronary disease irrespective of angina. So this was the recommendation. And remember, although it's a strong recommendation, there's actually only low quality evidence for it. Uh, we recommend that it be considered in systolic heart failure where we have non-invasive testing uh, supporting this, and this is now a strong recommendation with better evidence or moderate quality evidence. So, based on what I've uh, shown you, because that was his thallium test, uh, and his angiogram, uh, would you bypass, transplant, LVAD, do nothing, uh, or there's no point? So, I think I heard the answer from the question from the audience, which was that you would bypass him. And he was seen by the surgeon. Uh, he had no chest pain. The angiogram was reviewed. He was felt to be uh, feasible, although he did have a not pretty angiogram. He was still felt to have targets, and he actually uh, went forward for revascularization. So just to touch on the STITCH trial, I think it's important. Uh, as you know, the primary endpoint was all-cause mortality. Secondary endpoints were cardiovascular mortality and all-cause mortality plus hospitalization. And as you know, the probability of death was not significantly different. Uh, the probability of death uh, from cardiovascular causes was just significant. And the probability of death or hospitalization uh, was significantly improved with bypass. But I think all of us are well aware that if we actually look to the actual treatment that was received, then when we look at the probability of death from any cause, there was a significant advantage for patients who underwent bypass surgery. And when we look at uh, it, it as well here, uh, a very significant benefit, whether or not they were as treated or as a per protocol to adjust for the early crossover, suggesting that bypass surgery does work in these patients. So from a CCS recommendation, we do consider bypass surgery for ischemic cardiomyopathy, EF less than 35, graftable coronaries, otherwise suitable, regardless of whether or not they have angina or heart failure symptoms, in order to improve quality of life, reduce mortality and hospitalization, uh, and that is obviously what was done with this gentleman. So I will close with these. You will have them again in your handouts, but they are uh, sort of an approach to the assessment of coronary disease in patients with heart failure, uh, followed by decision tree regarding coronary revascularization. They're actually very, very helpful, uh, and they will all be in your package. Thank you.